Um, so uh, welcome everybody, I'm Rick Feinberg. Uh, again, I'm the uh, press officer of the American Astronomical Society and I'm also serving as project manager for the task force. It's my job to uh, do whatever Claire and Angela ask. Um, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to uh, session two on solar eclipse eye safety today. I'm trying to avoid saying anything about what time it is because everybody's in a different time zone. Um, so uh, today we're gonna have a, uh, a lecture or a, a talk by uh, Ralph Chu, who I'll introduce in a minute. Um, and then we'll do some Q&A after that. And then we're gonna have a, a small panel uh, with a few more very short talks and then uh, plenty of time, I hope, for uh, Q&A about solar eclipse eye safety. So let me introduce our featured speaker. Um, it's Dr. Ralph Chu, whose name I'm sure is familiar to many, if not all of you. Uh, Dr. Ralph Chu has been chasing solar eclipses since his teens. Uh, he's not in his teens anymore. Uh, he studied astronomy and astrophysics at the University of Toronto and optometry at the University of Waterloo. And then he taught at the University of Waterloo uh, for 40 years. Uh, he's now retired. He's a professor emeritus in the School of Optometry and Vision Science. And because of his joint interest and expertise in astronomy and vision and optometry, he has become and is acknowledged as the worldwide, uh, the, the world's foremost expert on e solar eclipse eye safety and on uh, protective solar filters. In addition to writing many scholarly papers and popular articles on these topics, he was the lead writer for the ISO 12312-2 solar filter standard, which you'll hear more about in his presentation. So with that, I will turn it over to Ralph Chu. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Rick. It's good to be here. And thanks everybody for attending this workshop. I'm just going to share my screen and uh, bring my talk up. And uh, hopefully this will work. It's up. There we go. Uh, everybody, I hope, can see that. And uh, we'll just get underway. Um, one of the things is that um, I'd like to just begin by talking a little bit about the problem of uh, eclipse-related eye injuries. Uh, solar retinopathy, or as it's sometimes referred to as retinal burns, have been associated with sunglass, uh, sun gazing for a long time. Uh, Galileo is often uh, cited as being somebody who might well have incurred some eye injuries when he tried to uh, view the sun through his telescope, uh, particularly since it's known that he did have poor vision later in life. However, uh, it's not likely it was solar retinopathy. Uh, uh, Galileo was pretty cagey, and uh, we know that in addition to selling the Galilean telescope to the Venetian Navy, uh, he also uh, used a uh, Keplerian uh, device to uh, project the sun to do his sunspot drawings. So uh, I think it's highly unlikely that um, uh, he had solar retinopathy and his vision problems were due to other things. More recently, though, what we found was that uh, during World War II and afterward, uh, there were lots of uh, reports of retinal injuries among air crews because of the uh, tactics of aviation warfare where uh, fighters dove out of the sun to attack aircraft. And that meant that uh, people were scanning the sky near the sun and they were getting uh, solar images burnt into their uh, retinas. Uh, later in the 1970s, there were reports of the acid heads uh, under the influence of LSD uh, staring at the sun to get the psychedelic effect. And there were a lot of uh, interesting articles in the literature about the uh, types of retinal injuries that were involved there. Certainly, there were also surveys being done about eye injuries following solar eclipses. And there have been a number of them over the last 60 or 70 years. Uh, the most recent one was uh, one that I refereed, which was by Caitley and company in the United Kingdom following the 1999 solar eclipse. And uh, in the United Kingdom, they reported on approximately 70 cases that were reported to the hospital eye services. And um, uh, uh, these were all uh, patients who ended up having recognizable 
retinal injuries of various sorts, which apparently resolved pretty much over the period of several weeks to months. And it's interesting to look at uh, the aspect about eye protection that of these people who reported to the eye service, 35% uh, had used sunglasses to observe the partial eclipse uh, uh, at their location. 15% said they had used eclipse glasses of some sort. Uh, and half of them were uh, uh, admittedly uh, using no protection at all. And the other uh, types of reports that I've seen over the years have similar kinds of uh, statistics. Well, what we do know about the uh, solar eclipse eye injuries is that essentially they are painless. Uh, they occur without any feeling at all because there are no pain sensors in the retina. Uh, and then in fact, that's why you don't really need a great deal of anesthesia when you have eye surgery on the retina because uh, no sense, no feeling. Uh, we also know that there's a latent period between the time that the injury occurs and when you get the onset of symptoms such as blurred vision. Uh, to a certain extent, we do know that the injuries are wavelength dependent in the sense that blue light uh, having a higher fo uh, per photon energy uh, is more efficient at uh, uh, eliciting an injury than red light. And so the spe there is the spectral dependence that we need to think about, but with sunlight, uh, just it is such a high level of exposure across the ent entire spectrum that that wavelength dependency really is not uh, really pertinent to our concerns. Uh, we do know that these types of injuries have a very highly variable recovery rate. It really depends on the conditions of exposure, whether it was just a brief uh, glance of, uh, say, a minute or so, or whether it was repeated glances over a period of hours. And uh, so it is very hard to predict on initial presentation what the, out, uh, the outcome is going to be for the person. We basically just need to let the eye uh, repair itself and see what happens at the end. The other thing is that we know that optical aids increase the severity. So if you are foolish enough to look at the sun through uh, some kind of accessory optics like a, a telescope or binoculars or what have you, uh, that just makes things worse. And the other thing is that uh, there is a combination of uh, radiative uh, effects that can uh, lead to different degrees of uh, injury. The bottom line is that everybody who looks uh, at uh, the sun under any circumstances, whether during a uh, solar eclipse or not, uh, if they look towards the solar disk, they are at risk. But particularly when we think about solar eclipses, who's the most likely to be injured? Well, as a parent, I can tell you this is right on the money and it didn't take my paper in 1981 for us to identify these people. Young males in the teens to the 30s who are unaware or uh, ignore the warnings about not looking, uh, who may not use the right protection and they report their symptoms the next morning. My Lord, there's a lot of different scenarios where this fits, but uh, truly fits for eclipses and uh, possible injuries. Uh, here's an example of a uh, what we call a photochemical injury in the eye, which is uh, really the uh, basic mechanism by which the retina is damaged uh, when you look at the sun. Uh, this spot here at the, uh, I'm not sure if you can actually see my cursor, uh, but. Yes, we uh, can, Rob. We can yeah, see it. Okay, great. So uh, I'm pointing at the spot where the injury has occurred, and it is just off center of the line of sight. The darker area here is what we call the macula. It's what you are using to look at my slide right now. And if you happen to have an, uh, a, a photochemical injury right at that spot, it's going to uh, basically blur your vision quite severely because what it's doing is disrupting the photoreceptors there. Uh, we know that this kind of injury 
um, uh, is very easily uh, elicited with blue light, as I said before, but with high volumes of uh, light uh, falling on the eye, we can uh, produce this kind of reaction by any spectral band that we want. We know that the, uh, uh, the critical dose is an irradiance level of about three watts per square meter equivalent. And uh, again, it usually elicits a temporary visual loss, which can take anything between weeks to months up to say uh, a year to recover. And it's the most common type of injury. If unfortunately you look for extended periods of time, then you can also get an additional effect because of the light passing through the retina and now being uh, absorbed by the underlying pigmented tissue, which acts as a light trap for the eye underneath the retina. If that radiation is uh, uh, absorbed there, uh, you get a buildup of heat, which will then uh, add to the photochemical loss in the photoreceptors of the uh, retinal tissues. And this is more likely to produce a permanent injury uh, if it occurs. Fortunately, we don't see too many of these anymore, but uh, certainly I've, cer uh, I've seen this type of injury and it is pretty devastating. Uh, if a person actually does look long enough, uh, as the patient reported by Wu et al. in 2017 uh, uh, did, you can take a photograph using OCT in the, um, uh, in the plane uh, rather than uh, section mode, and you can actually map out the receptors. This shot is really spectacular uh, because with OCT techniques these days, optical uh, computed tomography, uh, you can actually resolve individual photoreceptors uh, in this field. And this dark smudge right here is the image of the sun essentially burnt into the photoreceptor outer segments. And so these are damaged photoreceptors uh, that are trying to repair themselves. And as you can see, they were able to correlate the appearance of this optical uh, uh, wound with the actual solar uh, uh, image during eclipse that fits with the profile here. So yes, we can actually tell when the patient actually looked at the sun in some cases. This is an extreme, but uh, it is instructive. Uh, here is one of the first uh, cases from 2017 that I'm uh, familiar with. Uh, here's the uh, OCT image of the retina, uh, which is almost like a micrograph uh, slide of it with the pigmented epithelium, the retinal photoreceptors, and um, the, uh, uh, the tissue here with the overlying neural uh, tissue, the optic nerve fibers, and so on. This white shadow right here with this spreading uh, represents the position of the uh, uh, burn, if you will, on this retina with this 18-year-old man who looked at uh, the partial uh, phase of the solar eclipse in 2017 uh, for several minutes without protection. And it was enough to, in fact, cause this uh, damage just next to the fovea. So uh, it, there is some swelling here that uh, dropped the visual acuity, but he recovered fairly quickly from this particular injury. But again, this is typical of what you can see uh, when these injuries occur. Essentially, what we have to do is protect the eye uh, whenever uh, any part of the solar disk is visible. Uh, so that means during the partial phases of a total solar eclipse and at all times during an annular eclipse or a partial eclipse. Uh, in the 1950s, uh, welder's glass started being uh, advocated by some amateur solar observers as ways to look at the partial eclipse of the sun uh, safely. And here's a, a, a spectral uh, uh, transmission curve of a welder's glass, which is tempered uh, green glass, very, very dark. You can see here the transmission level. Uh, this is decimal transmittance. So 100% transmittance is up here. And we are down here in the visible and the ultraviolet at somewhere around 10 to the minus six or so. 
uh, for the transmission. And being a green glass, we have this peak of transmission, which uh, means that when you look through this, everything looks basically green. Over here, we have the infrared spectrum. Uh, essentially, 1400 nanometers, 14,000 angstroms is where our uh, region of concern ends because, uh, oops, sorry, beyond 1400, none of this radiation gets through to the back of the eye. It's all absorbed by water in the tissues of the eye. But anywhere from 1400 down to approximately uh, 380 or so nanometers uh, gets to the eye. And so we need to have protection from 380 basically over to 1400 for our purposes. Okay, so Walter's glass is pretty effective, but you've got this green image and it's not optical quality. So you can't use it on uh, say a camera or anything else. Uh, the late Roger Tuthill uh, discovered as he called it, solar screen, which is basically uh, a, uh, a filter material made of polyester or as we call it, mylar is the trade name. Uh, and this is a double layer of aluminum deposited uh, polyester where the two aluminum faces are together. Uh, it's bonded as a sandwich and you have the uh, polyester on the outside surface facing the world. So as long as you don't breach that polyester, the aluminum can't deteriorate. Uh, this is a, um, uh, a different material altogether. Uh, one of the problems with measuring transmissions uh, at these levels is the noise, and you can see how much the noise level is here. But uh, this is very effective in the ultraviolet up to 400 in that you're at transmissions of 10 to the minus seven. Uh, peak in the blue here at about 10 to the minus four, and then it falls off to about 10 to the minus five through the visible. And then in the, in the infrared, uh, there we go off again. And, and again, you can see here the thin film interference effects on the transmission uh, curve. But the bottom line on this one is, again, a, a very nice filter in the sense that it's filtering out the visible light to a, a, a high degree. And this transmission curve gives you that blue rendering, uh, the bluish white rendering of the solar image through this filter. Uh, we have a similar kind of behavior with the batter uh, uh, astrosolar safety film, which is a European product. Uh, and you can see that the curves are almost identical because they basically use the same technology. So uh, this is the state of the art um, up to about um, I would say uh, 1990 or thereabouts. Uh, and, uh, you know, this was the material that was being sold for the solar eclipse in 1999 over Europe. And uh, in the run up to the eclipse during the previous winter, there was a, a, an issue that arose over whether sputtered metal coatings on polyester were truly safe. It turned out the person who raised this was somebody who was selling a competing product, but uh, irrespective of that, there was still a true question about whether it was really safe because they found uh, some solar eclipse glasses that were being sold that had what they called pinholes, and they were alleging that these were dangerous. And so I got a few of these into my lab to look at, and here's what we found. Um, there were a few of these viewers that had these irregular uh, types of uh, very large apparent openings in the coatings. You can see the sizes here, uh, again, not very big. And, and there was an allegation that these uh, types of openings in the filter would uh, not let enough sunlight through to cause damage to the eye of the wearer. Uh, and there was one really spectacular one. This one was huge. You know, we're, we're talking about something almost a millimeter in size. But it was instructive because if you take a look very carefully here, here's the double layer of aluminum in the filter. And here we have a single layer of aluminum with a few more small pinholes, which are not of much concern. So, uh, you know, we looked at this, we uh, tried to do the number crunching, and basically we found that these pinholes 
although they were unsightly and they were glare filled, uh, glare sources, they really didn't do much in terms of uh, compromising safety. But it was a problem when it came to sellability of these products because of the presence of the pinholes. Now, uh, this sometimes still will occur in some product, but most of the stuff I've seen over the last few years, this is no longer uh, such a problem. And uh, we don't need to be worried about these pinholes anymore. But the upshot of this controversy was that in Europe, uh, uh, you know, there were uh, regulatory barriers that were raised uh, and uh, there was an attempt to uh, uh, address this in uh, a legal framework. But from a technical point, uh, uh, we saw the uh, development of what's now called black polymer. And here's a trace of a black polymer filter. This one's in percentage transmissions. So uh, if you're looking at this, just think of this as being two units, uh, uh, two log units uh, uh, lower to get it to decimal transmissions equivalents. And you'll see that these are filters that are performing very much the same as the welder's glass and so on, except that now we've got a fairly uniform uh, transmission across here, uh, maybe a slight more peaking towards the long wave uh, portion of the spectrum, which means that this is going to end up with an orange or reddish type of uh, color rendition of the solar image. And um, again, this is what we see in most filters nowadays, but it arose from the need to come up with an alternative to the aluminum to polyester. The upshot of it, though, was that in the European community, they developed the EN1836, the European normal or European standard. Uh, and uh, it took them roughly four years to get this through the uh, approval process, but it did establish a, um, uh, a set of criteria for solar filters that were used for direct views of the sun. In 2010, we began work on uh, uh, updating that to try and accommodate some of the new technologies that were being used. Uh, and in 2015, that standard uh, was finally approved and published, and it replaced the EN1836. And this is the standard that we're using nowadays uh, for all of the um, uh, filters that are uh, used for visual observation without uh, optical aids. Uh, it is a personal protective equipment standard under the European rules because it's something that's directly worn on uh, the face or held in front of the face uh, to shield the eyes from the sun. Uh, and so one thing to remember about the ISO standard is that it applies only to filters that are used without optical instruments. Any photographic filter or a filter that is intended for use with an optical instrument like the telescope or binocular is not covered by the standard, although the transmission requirements actually work very well for those kinds of protective filters as well. And uh, the terms of the standard do allow for retailers uh, to be able to advertise that their products comply, and of course, manufacturers can state whether they uh, have compliant product or not. Uh, in a nutshell, what ISO 12312-2 does is set out uh, requirements for luminous transmittance, which means we take the physical transmittance curve that I showed you earlier, and we multiply uh, those transmittance levels uh, with a spectral weighting factor, which is wavelength dependent, uh, and that turns it into a measure of uh, what you might call perceived brightness of the solar image uh, as seen through the filter. So it's a connection between the physical and the uh, sensory uh, uh, input uh, that we have here. Uh, we also have requirements for ultraviolet and infrared transmission, uh, which is also important for these filters. Uh, there are requirements about the material and surface quality of the filters. Uh, there are uh, requirements about security of mounting. We also have dimensions uh, for the whole assembly to ensure that when used 
as instructed and held in front of the, uh, or worn in front of the eyes, that uh, there is no chance of sunlight directly entering the eyes uh, uh, around the filter. And then there's labeling requirements, and um, this too is an important aspect, as we have seen. Uh, if people want to have products carry the ISO logo, there's a certification process which uh, has to be uh, put through, uh, but it involves what are called accredited test laboratories, uh, where uh, the laboratories have to go through a fairly rigorous uh, inspection and compliance uh, regime to uh, show that they are capable of making the measurements uh, for transmission uh, of the filters uh, with the necessary uh, uh, levels of precision and uncertainty uh, that will uh, make sure that, in fact, the products are adequately tested. And this becomes an uh, extremely important aspect when it comes to looking at compliance of filters. Uh, Rick has uh, really touched on what we did in 2017 with uh, the uh, safety campaign. Uh, it did involve a safety flyer, which was available to the public. There was also a specialist package that we prepared, which was aimed at uh, educators, eye care providers, and the media, which gave background information in much more detail than the safety flyer. And it included that filters had to comply with the ISO 12312 2. Uh, we spent a lot of time uh, doing interviews, all of us on the uh, campaign. Uh, there were a lot of filters that came in for us to look at. Uh, and, um, you know, overall, I think things went reasonably well. How did it turn out? Well, uh, I think extremely well in the, fa uh, in the sense that for once, we actually had a safety campaign where the astronomy and the eye care communities essentially gave the same advice. We didn't have uh, the eye care people coming out and saying, no, you shouldn't look at it at all, or you should just watch it on television or whatever. They actually embraced the concept of using the solar filters. Uh, and uh, uh, they all, uh, it turned out that both the optometry and ophthalmology uh, websites uh, carried the same uh, video that I prepared for astronomy uh, showing how to photograph and view the eclipse. And so uh, things worked out really well. There was high public awareness of the uh, safe viewing practices. And uh, I think we have pretty good compliance for the most part, uh, with one exception, but that was another thing. Uh, in the aftermath of the eclipse, we inevitably did have a few people who uh, did figure that they might have hurt their eyes. And indeed, uh, the American Society of Retinal Specialists by December of 2017 had reported about uh, 25 individuals uh, who uh, hurt one or both eyes. And here's just some of the presenting symptoms. Uh, majority of the individuals presented with blurry vision the next morning, uh, 19 out of the 25. Five of them reported what we call distorted vision rather than blurred vision. Uh, 15 of them had measurable visual field defects at the center of vision. There was one person who had no symptoms and in fact had no problems, but just turned up because they had taken a sneaky glance at the sun without protection and they wanted to make sure they hadn't hurt themselves and indeed they hadn't. Uh, of the 35 eyes that showed damage, 12 of them showed a yellow lesion in the retina, which uh, we uh, put down to being uh, uh, an unprotected view that gave them a photochemical burn, as it were. 13 of them had retinal pigmentary changes, which indicate that they looked a bit longer than they really should have and they not only had the photochemical, but probably also uh, a certain amount of thermal damage as well. The good thing is that uh, for these people, as far as we can tell, uh, the retinal specialists uh, reported that these people basically all recovered their vision. Uh, Macula Society uh, in the US uh, reported 10 retinal injuries, but there was no follow-up for us to be able to say uh, what happened to those individuals uh, ultimately. 
And similarly, the American Optometric Association reported 13 retinal injuries that were uh, uh, reported to their uh, headquarters. So basically, we top this up, we've got 48 cases basically among the 350 million people who potentially observed some uh, uh, aspect of that eclipse. Uh, Europe, by comparison, 1999 with a similar population base, there were probably around maybe 150 to 200 people who uh, ended up with eclipse-related eye injuries. So overall, I think we did much better uh, in 2017. Hopefully, we will do uh, even better in 2023 and 2024. Uh, I'll just finish up by uh, talking about a bit of work that Rick and I and uh, uh, my colleague Stephen Dane at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia, have done on the filters that we received uh, uh, as part of the safety campaigns endorsement uh, program. Uh, we uh, looked at a number of these filters as well as a couple of samples that uh, were taken from my private collection that I've been assembling for the last four decades. And uh, we assessed all of these for compliance with uh, the ISO standard. Uh, we found that all of these basically met the UV and IR blockage requirements, and also that they had luminous transmittances that ranged from uh, equivalent shade numbers of, of 16 to 12. Uh, I'm just not going to read that many decimal places uh, of zeros. Anyway, uh, we were also able to correlate the luminous transmittance of these filters with the acceptability of the brightness of the solar image that was rendered. And um, this is an important thing because uh, one of the uh, concerns that we have with these uh, filters that are being produced is that some of them may be a little bit too dark. And if that's the case, then uh, you'll have problems with the sun being so dark uh, when viewed through these things that people stop using. Them. And um, so uh, this has some significant uh, it, uh, ramifications. Other things that we looked at, we checked the dimension requirements and basically found that paper spectacles met the dimensional requirements, but there were some products that didn't make them, even though other aspects of their performance were very good. I'll show you those in a moment. Uh, the big problem was compliance labels. Uh, uh, a lot of these filters that were produced for the 2017 Eclipse, uh, the um, manufacturers of those products did not include labeling. Now, maybe some of that was because what we were looking at was uh, preliminary samples before they went to production, or it was before they actually had the, the printing set up to um, uh, go on to these things. But this was one issue from the samples that we had that a lot of them just didn't have the right label. Uh, these are the paper filters that we see a lot, solar eclipse glasses that are produced by, uh, for example, Rainbow Symphony and American Paper Optics. Uh, but also here are a couple of products that were introduced for 2017. So these are plastic sunglass frames with a harder version of the same black polymer type uh, that are set into the lenses. And these work really well when they're uh, put on the face. They've got but this nasal cutaway here, if you take a look at these compared to what is specified for these paper products, these would fail. And um, this was a, a bit of an issue with the test laboratories because they really didn't know how to deal with this kind of product. But um, it is something that we are going to have to address in the ISO standard. The other thing that isn't shown here is the handheld viewer. We saw a uh, couple of really good examples of those in the video from the uh, 2017 clips in uh, Salem, uh, Oregon. And um, those are just basically uh, a rectangular piece of paper or different shapes with uh, the filter being intended to be held in front of the eyes uh, with the hands. And that's another uh, type of uh, mounting that isn't covered by the ISO 12312-2 right now but we are going to have to amend the standard to uh, uh, accommodate that kind of product as well. 
Uh, we are going to be proposing new limits on the transmission. Uh, the existing limits are the dashed line here for uh, around 11 and a half shade number down here to about, um, well, this is about shade 15 and a half or so. Uh, but in our testing of some of these products, we found that we could drop this a little bit and still have an acceptable filter in terms of uh, a comfortable view of the sun. And so we feel that on the basis of what we saw in the 2017 product, uh, we're going to pr uh, propose this uh, modification. It isn't going to affect any of the uh, currently available products, but it just, uh, you know, uh, I think will make for a, uh, an offering to the public that will uh, allow for uh, comfortable viewing uh, for a lot more circumstances. And let's see, what else do I have? Oh yes, so uh, we're, uh, these are the things that we're going to be looking at for revisions then, the luminous transmittance limits, uh, the dimensions for the paper frames will be updated to accommodate the other types of uh, viewers. And another thing, what we found is that uh, there's a best before date on these filters. Uh, that may sell more filters, but it really doesn't do anything uh, in terms of time, uh, but we'll see what happens. So uh, hopefully in 2023 and 2024, people will be enjoying the eclipse like these folks did in Bucharest in 1999. And with that, I'll turn things back over uh, for questions. Thank you very much, Ralph. That was a very, very thorough uh, going over of, of all the basics on solar filters, and we appreciate it. And I see that we have got quite a few questions queued up. Uh, the uh, person who's going to be reading the questions for us this afternoon is Tyler Nordgren from the Space Art uh, Travel Bureau. Uh, Tyler is in the, uh, let's see, I think you're, you're up in, uh, in New York, in upstate New York now, right? Yep. I'm just a few short miles off the path of totality for 2024. And it was a beautifully clear day yesterday. Excellent. So looking through the questions, uh, Margaret Hill asks, what about using the solar filters in connection with corrective lenses? An excellent question because uh, a lot of people do wear corrective lenses. The important thing is that uh, you want the uh, filter to be held in front of your glasses. Uh, and that's really more just for a uh, comfort thing. You know, trying to slip those uh, viewers down in behind your glasses, really, uh, there isn't enough room. And, uh, you know, if you uh, wear glasses like I do, you can put those filters just over the glasses, hook them over your ears, and you're fine. Okay. And uh, a common question, uh, this is from Dean Pesnell, uh, is are the solar classes really safe after five years of storage? I'm still using uh, solar eclipse glasses that uh, Roger Tuthill sent me 30 years ago. All right. Uh, Lucia Breimer asks- uh, Actually, if, do, you, do you mind if I add, add something to that? Um, what, we, what we did in 2017, because we, we did get that question a lot then too, uh, is uh, we recommended that you, you, know, you inspect your filters. It, it really depends on how they were stored, right? If they're, if they're at the bottom of your junk drawer, uh, and you're throwing coins and keys and other things in there, then the filters are going to get scratched up. So, you, so, but if you put them in an envelope and stick them, you know, in a in a book or something like that, uh, they're going to be in pristine condition when you pull them out a few years later. So, as long as you inspect them and make sure that they're not torn or uh, punctured or that they're not coming loose from the frames or anything like that, they're going to be fine. Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, one thing that I will comment on that it's the security of the uh, of the filters in the paper mount that is really, really important. The way that these filters are made, the aluminum is actually not exposed. It's under the my or, or polyester film. So it's inside. Um, you can't actually touch the aluminum. Uh, you can scuff the polyester, but the aluminum will not be damaged. And I, I've crinkled up these things and uh, then tried to use them. And uh, you know, the main problem with crinkling them is the damage the paper mounting. So as long as the paper mounting is in good shape, it should be fine. 
Uh, if there's any doubt, by all means, discard the thing, get a new one. They're not that expensive and it just makes sure you're safe. But if you've taken good care of them like I have, uh, there's no reason to suspect that uh, your glasses are going to be any worse off than they were the first day you used them. But, uh, you know, even with puncturing, I've tried to puncture it, and it's not easy. Polyester film is amazingly tough. So puncturing is not an issue. Damaging the aluminum might be. Damaging the mounting definitely will be. What about black polymer in terms of its resistance to puncture? The black polymer is also very, very strong. Uh, it's a resin material of some sort with the carbon black embedded in it. It's basically our modern day equivalent of smoked glass. Uh, and uh, the main thing there is making sure that those filters don't get dislodged from the mounting itself. But again, I'm sure Sophie can talk about that, that uh, they've done a lot of work in making sure that uh, those filters are uh, very secure. And if you damage the mounting, then get rid of it. But otherwise, they should last very well. All right. On the subject of uh, filter material, uh, this question comes from Meg Thatcher. Is the filter material that is used for telescopes and binoculars the same as the filter material in the naked eye eclipse viewers? I.e., can you purchase the same material to make telescope filters and eclipse glasses? Uh I think we'll leave that to um, uh, Sophie and uh, other people to talk about, but uh, you know, they basically are the same material. I can answer it um, now if you'd like. Yes, it is the same material. We also do have telescope uh, paper filters that you can look at on our website. I can include a link in the in. Uh, the comments here, but yes, they are the same material. So in the plastic, uh, the, the solar viewing cards that Ralph had mentioned and the any filters that we have, that will all be the same material. All right, see, uh, moving to some questions about eye damage. Uh, let's go back to uh, Lucia Brimer. If retinal burns were resolved within weeks, does that mean that they are temporary? That's right. Um, you know, there may be some residual things that a clinician would be able to see in the retina, but from a functional point of view of the, uh, uh, if the vision recovers, uh, then basically the eye is going to function pretty much like it did before it was injured. Uh, and that's Which, been our experience. Okay, so that, that leads into Jay Pasikoff's question saying, Ralph, you cited 48 cases of some eye damage. Do you have an assessment at six months later? There was no follow-up uh, from the organizations with their members. They basically got the information about uh, what happened uh, and then they just sort of dropped it because it didn't appear that there was going to be anything uh, useful out of it. But uh, I would uh, have to refer to the Cately study where they did do a follow-up. And what they found was that over the course of about six months, uh, all of their patients recovered their vision. There was no uh, loss of vision uh, overall. Uh, it took a few people longer than others to recover their vision, but they all recovered. Uh, I think the Wu case uh, that um, you have that picture from, uh, that particular individual took somewhat longer to recover uh, vision and it was not a complete recovery of vision. So the thing is that um, people will look unprotected at the sun. Uh, they are going to be uh, playing the odds. And um, you know our, our position is basically get the viewer, use it, and don't take a chance. So this leads into a great question from uh, David Barron, uh, who says, what advice do you give for naked eye viewing of partial eclipses right at sunrise or sunset? We've all gazed at the sun on the horizon. Uh, I trust that this is safe or, or is it? Yeah, that's a really good question because uh, Rick and I have uh, certainly bandied this around because uh, you know we have a real problem with this 
eclipse in June. Uh, for much of North America, it's a dawn eclipse. The sun will rise already eclipsed and people will want to look at it. And the, the thing is that just as at sunrise and sunset outside of eclipses, we can see the solar disk right above the horizon. Uh, it's it, that lovely deep red color and you can look at it. It's a bit bright, but you can see it and you have no effect on your vision. The thing is that it doesn't take very long for the sun to rise to the point where the disk starts to turn yellow and then yellow white. And by that time, the, the actual uh, uh, irradiance level is high enough that you're now in jeopardy of uh, incurring a photochemical injury. And so essentially, as long as the sun is about your extended fist or less below, uh, you know, smaller than that uh, angle above the horizon, you're probably safe. But beyond that, you're going to have to use a solar filter. And here's where our problem is with some of the darker ones. They will be so dark that even with the yellowish sun, uh, at that low angle, uh, it's going to be almost impossible to see the sun through the filter. Uh, we have a major problem that way, and I, I don't have a solution for it other than extreme caution. Uh, you know, once the sun gets higher, then it'll be easy, you know, just look through the filter. But there's that area from about maybe eight to 20 degrees all, uh, elevation where uh, the sun is going to be uh, difficult to see. And I, I don't have a solution. Yeah, we've tended to not want to put in writing <laughs> anything about unprotected viewing of the sun at any, even at very low elevations, simply because we don't want somebody to point to it and say, uh, you know, this, this organization said it was okay. Um, it, it depends so much on local circumstances. In addition to the elevation above the horizon, uh, it's the clarity of the air. You know, I mean, there have been times when you could, you could just look right at the sun because there's so much haze or so many clouds uh, and you know you're fine, but, uh, but you can't put it in writing because it's a judgment call. And it depends on your reaction to the to the brightness of the sun. It's not not anything that you can you know list as as a definite uh, breakpoint between safe or not safe. Uh, we've got a question here from Zach Stockbridge asking about what shade of welder's glass will fall within this new range. Is number fourteen enough, or should it be down to number fifteen? Uh, actually, shade fourteen is right in the middle of the range. Uh, uh, and the recommendation that um, has hung around of 13 or 14 is still good. 15 is a little bit too dark, really. And 12, uh, depending on whether it's glass or uh, polycarbonate, may end up being too bright. So, um, you know, I, I'd say if you can get a shade 14, that's your pretty much uh, uh, best uh, choice of all the uh, available getting anything darker is pretty hard uh, because they're not used very often 15 or 16 so 14 is is yeah i've always thought for me personally i've always liked 13 better but now that uh eclipse glasses are available so readily and inexpensively i don't work i don't use uh, welder's filters anymore I, I guess along a similar vein in talking about the uh the sunrise uh evan zucker asks or, or says, so is the solution to use welder's glass of lower designations, such as 13, 12, and 11, when the sun's on the horizon? I would say 11 or, uh, well, 12 will fall within the um, recommended limits of the uh, ISO standard and will be light enough, if you will, that uh, with a low elevation, you can still see the sun through it. Uh, the main problem, though, is that that's not a photographic quality filter. And uh, that's going to be an issue if somebody's trying to take photographs because um, the, uh, the solar filters themselves are just too dark to get a good image through them. Although I suppose if you crank up the ISO, you might get something through it. Um, interesting experiment. I, I'll have to try that, but it means having to uh, go out from the house here where we're under... COVID lockdown, find a place where I've got a clear horizon that I can actually look at the, the sun through the filter. 
here's what I'd like to do now. Um, since Ralph's going to be in the uh, in the panel, um, and since we're starting to run a little bit over, I was thinking, why don't we uh, stop the Q and A for the moment? Uh, but don't don't dismiss any questions or uh, mark them as answered that, that haven't been answered yet. Uh, we'll go into the panel discussion. Uh, and then when we come back for questions, we can pick up where we left off. How's that sound? All right. Okay. So um, let's see. Claire, if you're out there and can start my slides, great. So what we're going to have, it's a three-part panel discussion. It's going to be me um, and Sophie Margolis, who you uh, heard from uh, briefly a few minutes ago, but I'll give her a, a more formal introduction before I turn it over to her. Uh, and then Ralph will come back to make a few uh, final points, and then we'll use the rest of the time for Q&A. So I have uh, some thoughts on solar eclipse eye safety. I'm going to um, only slightly overlap uh, with Ralph and tell a few other uh, parts of the story. So uh, go ahead and go on to the first slide, please, Claire. Thank you. All right, so if this woman is anything like your mother, she told you uh, never to look at the sun, right? Never look at the sun. Uh, but those of us who do astronomy know that in fact, it's okay at, at certain times. And so if you'll uh, press next, um, it, the, in particular, uh, it's during a total solar eclipse. Um, because so many people have always heard that it's never safe to look at the sun, they've thought that you can't look directly at a total solar eclipse. Uh, and we've all heard stories of people who refuse to take their filters off once the eclipse goes total and wonder what all the fuss was about because they didn't see a darn thing. But a total solar eclipse, as Angela mentioned, is only about as bright as the full moon. And so uh, it's perfectly safe to look at. Um, we had some questions, uh, even uh, surprisingly from some um, eye doctors <laughs> who I saw quoted in the media saying, well, you, you really, you still shouldn't look at the sun uh, even during totality because, uh, you know, the sun emits dangerous rays during a solar eclipse. Uh, but that's not really true. Um, the, uh, the sun, the, whatever the sun's doing during a total solar eclipse is the same thing it was doing before the eclipse and is doing after the eclipse and is doing on any other day. Uh, if you'll press next, um, the, uh, the sun doesn't, you know, do anything any different than it does on a normal day. Um, sometimes I've read that uh, people are concerned, well, the moon, the moon has a, an effect where it, you know, it focuses the sun's rays, but that's not true. There's no mechanism for it to do that. Uh, certainly the moon is not massive enough to do any gravitational lensing uh, and it doesn't have an atmosphere, so it can't focus uh, the sunlight passing uh, beyond it. So the next slide. So the reality is that it's okay to look at the sun with the unaided eye, even with a telescope, without protection uh, during totality. But at any other time, for example, um, go ahead and press next, thank you. When no solar eclipse is occurring, people often forget that you can look at the sun through a solar filter without an eclipse, or during a partial eclipse or an annular eclipse, or during the partial phases of a total or an annular eclipse. Um, the sun is just too darn bright. You can't look at it. Uh, there's the risk of retinal injury, as Ralph has made very clear. So to the, observe the sun outside of an eclipse, you have to view it in one of two ways. You can use a special purpose solar filter and look directly at it. Um, and we now understand the word safe to mean one that complies with the ISO standard. Or there are indirect ways of looking at the sun, such as pinhole projection or optical projection. I used to hear people say that pinhole projection was the absolute safest way to look at the sun because uh, when you do it properly, you've got the sun at your back. Uh, you're projecting the solar image through a pinhole onto a card or onto the ground or something. The problem is that some people, when handed a pinhole card, uh, think you're supposed to look through the pinhole at the sun. Uh, and that is absolutely not true. That is not safe at all. So as, if you're doing pinhole projection, sure, it's safe. But you just hand somebody a pinhole projector and say, here, you can use this to look safely at the sun. You better make sure you tell them a little bit more than that about how to do it. Next slide. Now, here's a point that hasn't been made yet. Well, actually, I think Ralph did make it. Um, but it's, a, it's one of the key points uh, that we make in our safety messaging, which is that you never look at the sun through unfiltered optics. And it isn't even safe to look at the sun through unfiltered optics while wearing your eclipse glasses, because you're letting all that light 
come into the telescope or the binoculars or the camera lens and getting concentrated onto the filter and it will cause it to burst into flame or melt or otherwise get damaged. So these filters that, that Ralph was just talking about are for naked eye viewing. And if you are gonna look at the sun um, or look at any part of an eclipse sun except totality, um, you press next, um, you have to put a filter over the front. Um, and in this case, what I've shown is uh, a solar filter uh, made from the aluminized polyester, uh, the Botter Astro Safety Film, the same stuff that they put in their glasses uh, on the main telescope. And then I've put a, a lens cap over the finder scope. Um, I don't want to let unfiltered sunlight into my finder scope because it's going to melt the crosshairs on the eyepiece in the finder. Next slide. So as Ralph said, we uh, put out a safety flyer. Uh, we put it out in English and Spanish, and we made it available for free download. We encouraged uh, the filter manufacturers to have it on their websites. Um, and we encouraged uh, everybody who had an Eclipse website leading up to 2017 uh, to post a link to it or to post the actual PDF on their site. Um, we developed the messaging very, very carefully with NASA. Um, NASA was in that camp uh, where they didn't, in the old days, they didn't want to recommend um, that anybody use any method other than uh, pinhole projection or some other indirect method. Uh, but once the ISO standard was in place, there was now a legitimate reason to accept that uh, some solar filters for direct viewing were, were in fact safe. So NASA came on board with us. Um, we got their endorsement. Um, and then we, uh, we went to some of the uh, optometric and ophthalmic uh, academies and got their endorsements. Um, and that was huge because as Ralph said, uh, for the first time in memory, uh, the astronomical community and the eye care community were giving the same messages about Eclipse eye safety. It turned out there were some, uh, there were more eye care academies than I realized. Um, and we'll go after some additional ones uh, for the messaging for 2023 and 2024. But there was one group that we desperately wanted to get to endorse our message that absolutely refused. Next slide. That's the very powerful and very influential American Medical Association. Now, the reason they didn't want to do it was because their leadership in 2016, 2017 uh, felt that the only way to avoid being asked to endorse every manner of product and service out there, because uh, everybody wants their endorsement, they just decided to not endorse anything no matter what. Uh, their leadership has changed and we have an ace in the hole because one of the members of the Solar Eclipse Task Force is Dr. Mario Mata. He was gonna be on the panel today, but he's on the board of the AMA and they scheduled a meeting for today too. So he had to be at that. He's past president of the Mass Medical Society. He's uh, lived in the Boston area for, for a long time. Um, and he's now he, here's what he wrote to me when I asked him uh, what I should say, given that he couldn't attend the panel today. He said, let everybody know I'm a trustee, which means I'm on the governing board, and I intend to get the AMA to cooperate with any public safety message that we craft. Next. He served uh, eight years on the AMA Council of Science and Public Health and was the primary writer of their reports on light pollution and the harmful effects of LED lighting. So Mario has not just a track record, but a track record with the AMA. And so we, uh, we feel quite confident that we're gonna be able to convince the current leadership, which is not as stringent as the past leadership uh, to get behind safety messaging. And that's gonna be huge because if the AMA uh, endorses our safety messaging, then that means that everybody from, uh, it won't just have to be your eye doctor, but it can be your family doctor, it can be um, you know, a practitioner at a walk-in health clinic, they're all going to be able to uh, provide the same uh, positive and effective messaging about observing the solar eclipse. Uh, and that's, I think, going to be key to what Ralph was uh, hoping for, which is that, in fact, we'll reduce the uh, number of eye injuries even further uh, for the two big coming North American eclipses. Next slide. All right. So, our original plan was just to beat the drum on the messaging about get your filters ISO, make sure you, you buy ISO certified filters. And then in the weeks leading up to the eclipse, and it was literally just in the weeks leading up, all of a sudden the market was flooded with what I was calling fakes or counterfeits. Um, a counterfeit is when you actually uh, 
you actually claim to be a product manufactured by a different company that that uh, that is ISO certified. So you know, here's a big collection of uh, Eclipse glasses, and it's not at all obvious which ones are the fakes. But if you uh, click next for me, Claire, um, it's right in the middle there. That that solar filter, that Eclipse glasses, uh, turns out to be a a counterfeit. It doesn't necessarily mean it's unsafe, but they couldn't demonstrate that they were in fact ISO certified. Now, if you go to the next slide. Uh, You'll notice that the, uh, the real one is on the top, at the top. It's made by American Paper Optics. The one on the bottom claims to be made by American Paper Optics, but is not. And it's the one that has the ISO labeling. Remember, Ralph said that uh, even uh, compliant filters in terms of the transmittances didn't always have compliant labeling. Well, it turns out that if you look at the fine print, uh, you do see the ISO number in the fine print on the American Paper Optics product, but they didn't use the ISO logo. Uh, they threw the CE logo on there instead, which is you know, technically kind of outdated. But the immediate giveaway that the that the uh, the ones on the bottom are not are not really from American Paper Optics is that the shape of the filter is different. Uh, American Paper Optics has those rounded corners. Um, now it turns out uh, one of the samples that uh, Ralph and Stephen Dane tested uh, as we were working on this paper um, was this uh, Chinese knockoff on the bottom. Um, and it passed, uh, but it was a bit darker than, uh, than optimal. Um, but, you know, so, but the problem is, uh, next slide, is that uh, these filters were being sold on Amazon. And people were buying filters on Amazon when the community of, uh, astronomers and uh, legitimate solar filter manufacturers uh, complained that, uh, that, they, that the market was being flooded by uh, fakes and counterfeits. Amazon's response was to shut down all solar filter sales. And this is like two or three weeks before the eclipse, the worst possible time when everybody's finally waking up to the fact that they need these things. Eventually they, uh, they restarted uh, selling. Um, after we worked with them uh, to, to basically teach them how to identify which filters were okay and which were not. Um, and as you see here, uh, even after they restarted, uh, the one on the left there is, is one of those plastic sunglass frames. So it could not possibly be ISO certified because uh, as Ralph pointed out, uh, the, the nasal cutout was, uh, was not to spec, uh, even though the filters are perfectly safe. But the point is that even after recognizing the problem and trying to address it, uh, they were still selling filters that claimed to be ISO certified, but really were not. So it was too little too late. Next slide. I actually invited, uh, oh yeah, so what did we do instead? Um, we came up with a backup plan. This is now with like two weeks to go. Um, this is the uh, solar filter page or the solar safety, uh, solar eclipse safety page on our website. Um, and if you click next, I think you pull up the, uh, the menu. Yeah, and we, we added a list of reputable vendors of solar viewers. And what this was, was um, we created a list. You can go to the next page. I'm not showing you the list. I'm just gonna show you the top of the page. Um, but we actually compiled a list of every manufacturer who, whose ISO test paperwork we had examined personally that is, I looked at it and I verified that it came from a recognized lab. Uh, and if I had any questions, I checked with the lab. And then we also listed all the dealers who were selling filters manufactured by those manufacturers. And anybody who wanted to get on this list had to convince us, the AAS, that they were selling a legitimate product. Uh, it became a full-time job for the last couple of weeks before the eclipse. Uh, because basically the word got out that the only filters you should buy were filters that were on this web page. Uh, so everybody who was trying to sell filters was sending us their filters and sending us their paperwork and saying, can we please get on your list? What was weird was that a lot of the paperwork that I was sent was clearly counterfeit uh, or, um, or it was irrelevant. Uh, for example, I was able to I got the same paperwork, the exact same paperwork from six or eight different companies. Um, the only thing that was different was the name of the company, but all the measurements were the same, uh, the same lab and all the rest of it. It was clearly not real. 
Um, and the other thing that was people were sending me paperwork certifying that their filters met the ISO 12311 or 312-1 standard, which is the sunglasses standard and sunglasses are not dark enough. So it became um, quite a zoo actually. But in the end, uh, as you saw, we didn't have serious uh, issues with eye injuries. So, so it ended up being successful. Uh, next slide. So I invited Amazon to participate in this panel and I got rebuffed with this message. Thanks for reaching out. We hope you've been well. Uh, we're gonna pass on the opportunity to speak, uh, but you know, please be assured we remain committed to customer safety. Well, that's just the kind of message you expect from a big corporate behemoth. Uh, we're not gonna leave it there. Um, Amazon did pledge after the 2017 debacle to do a better job for the coming eclipses. Um, and I intend to hold them to it. Um, and so we'll see how that goes. Uh, the last thing we want is a repeat of what happened in 2017. Ralph mentioned some of the other things uh, that we made available, and I, I like to plug this because it's, uh, it's the single best uh, resource for uh, solar eclipse eye safety and the ISO standard and uh, proper ways of observing a solar eclipse. Um, it's this uh, technical document that you can get from the solar eclipse website, AAS. Um, if you, get, you can get it from our download section or you can get it uh, in the eye safety section, but it's, uh, it's really nice. Um, and I'm sure Ralph will want to update it a little bit for 2023, 2024, after we get, hopefully get our paper accepted. All right, next slide. I think my next slide is my last slide. That's all I have. So one person who did agree to come, uh, I'm very glad to say, is Sophie Margolis, who is uh, at Rainbow Symphony, one of the companies that, um, that Ralph mentioned. Uh, so about Rainbow Symphony, about 40, more than 40 years ago now, um, a passionate artist and dedicated eclipse chaser named Mark Margolis founded this company uh, to create special purpose eyeglasses to explore the wonders of astronomy, nature, and light and color. Well, Rainbow Symphony is now a family business. Uh, Sophie Margolis joined her dad at the company seven years ago, right out of college, to help prepare for the 2017 solar eclipse. She works in marketing, helping to move the business forward and runs their e-commerce operation. And I asked uh, Sophie to join us today to give us the manufacturer's perspective on uh, what they learned from 2017 and give us a little insight into how they're going to uh, handle the demand for what are now going to be two back-to-back -back solar eclipses six months apart, blanketing all of North America. So I'll turn it over to Sophie. Sophie, you'll need to unmute and start your video. Hi, sorry. That's okay, okay. we got you. I'm gonna share my screen, so let me go ahead and do that. Just wanna make sure, can everyone see this PowerPoint? Not yet. Oh goodness, okay, hold on. Oh wow, I'm the one with the technical difficulties, the irony. Okay, let's see, share screen, Zoom screen broadcast. Nope. It's not working. Maybe, okay. Maybe we uh, can pull it up. I have it on the Google just so that just in case this happened. I have it here. I can, uh, I can play it for you. Give me one second. Play. Great. Thank oh, you, Claire. Gosh. I was just going to ask. Thank you, Claire. Yeah, I don't have, it doesn't go in much of an order. So I'll just say next when, when it's just for visuals. Ooh. All right. Well, while we're getting that up, I will introduce myself. Um, I am Sophie. I have been working at Rainbow Symphony for about seven years. Um, I came on to actually help with eclipse planning and preparing for 2017. So after 2017, I decided to stick around because I saw the outcome of what happened and I knew we got to do it again, but this time with a learning curve. Um, my eclipse experience, my first eclipse experience was when I was eight and it was in France and we actually got rained out. So for many reasons, 2017 was truly my Super Bowl. It was pure magic witnessing something so indescribable, but also feeling a tangible, seeing a tangible product in the wild that we helped make uh, used by millions. Uh, that's kind of something I can't explain or put into words. 
For me, Eclipse 2017 was my master's in business. I grew the tools I needed to, to contribute in a way that I think would help us, but more importantly, safely covering as many people as possible, efficiently and in the most organized way. 2017 ended and it definitely didn't take us long enough to uh, long to, for us to start discussing how we would do it differently and how we would improve everything for us to start discussing um, things from production to new systems. The thing I was most obsessed with, and we can actually go to the next slide, uh, was how to automate the business and the customer experience without taking away the educated and helpful side of our business. That's the challenge we're primarily still working on today, but I feel we've made great strides. My job while preparing for 2017 uh, really was all customer facing. I and one other person were in charge of managing every custom job, every online order and every personal tale someone wanted to call and tell us about. And I saw that there was room for to improve their experience, but I also saw that there was room to better our experience as well. That starts with our systems, accounting, detailed blogs, sharing documents, production schedules, organizational programs, all that could help target larger and smaller projects. Um, we've had some practices implementing some of these new automations in, with the 2019 and 2020 South American eclipses, and it's proving that we are definitely on the right track. Um, I'm sure for most of this group of what I'm saying is common knowledge, but the ability to communicate at the speed of light with people's often very unreal expectations is constantly changing for us. What we also noticed with people's expectations was that there was also an element of trust and guidance that our customers expected from us. Having the owner of the company, Mark, my dad, uh, being an actual Eclipse, avid Eclipse chaser himself helped create the trust in our brand. When talking about safety, you definitely need to approach it from a scientific perspective, which is what we've all learned so far, but also from a human experience perspective, which I think that we are definitely uh, very good at. Um, you are asking people to look at the sun, which is a huge deal. So education with our employees is really the first component and key for everyone here to understand how to convey the importance of the experience, but also how to properly explain the safety measures as well. Um, being a manufacturer of products, organizations, and logistics is a big thing. Anticipating far in advance the ordering and movement of materials is definitely our main focus. Communication with our vendors has been crucial to our success, and in the past, and remains in, in, in the past, and it remains critically important to what we do in the future. How we produce more goods in a shorter period of time in a more efficient way with shipping and distribution has been another main question we've been tackling. This actually now brings me to some specifics that we're going uh, that we're actually going to do and implement for 2023 and 24. We can actually go to the next um, slide. One thing that we saw was our consume. Oh, is there is there? I think there, there was only two there's... slides in there. Oh, that's weird. I had I had more that I added, but and it was a live oh, document, shoot. so it's okay. I'll, I can, see can, if I can, I'll stop I and download have... it in the meantime. <laughs> you keep I'm talking, sorry. and I'll see what I can. I have okay. a, I have. Well, I don't think I received it in time to put in our Google Drive, but I can send. Um, I can send Claire the link you sent me to the Dropbox. Oh, okay, no problem. I'm although, sorry about although that. Although she may not be able to get into it. <laughs> well, <laughs> try it over. <laughs> well, it's okay. I can I can share it after as well. It's nothing too crazy. It's just us talking about a blog, which we could go back to the first slide, um, and we I could just continue talking about that. That's not a problem. Um, so. Uh, talking about the specifics of what we're actually going to do. The one main thing that we saw in 2017 was that our customers started to break apart into three main categories. Um, our online direct to consumer customer is one, uh, our custom jobs that kind of are in one massive run similar to like a marketing campaign or maybe a smaller, uh, a smaller company that just wants to do advertising. And then lastly, which I have a few people in this room are ongoing resellers who depended on us continuously to produce glasses until our end date. Um, we learned that each of those customers needed a different approach. 
The online customer needed a seamless checkout experience and would love resources broken down into layman's terms. We started our blog, Standing in the Light, on our new website where um, people can go and read articles, which I shared, which I'll send afterward. Just simple things like from anything from like what happens to your animals during the eclipse? Like silly questions, but also how to prepare for 2023 and 24. What is it like not being in the path of totality and why you should go to the path? Things like that. Um, I would like to note that it would actually be great if anyone would like to contribute to that blog. Uh, it's an open forum for anyone to want to contribute, who wants to contribute, absolutely can. And you can link to resources that you share yourself. Um, the one-off customer who was sort of like a marketing campaign customer, they just needed a little bit more hand-holding in terms of understanding the custom process and maybe an outline, but that was more just about a production time and a schedule and being done. The last and most probably complicated and detailed customer was our ongoing partners who needed to know that we could produce quickly produce at a consistently high quality, and most importantly, be a part of the production process. Um, although I can't share all of our trade secrets, we do feel it's important to create something where our ongoing reordering customers, some of uh, you are in this room, like I had mentioned, uh, have somewhere they can go to actually see where their job is in, pro in, in the production process. Having that transparency only grows a trust and confidence in us, and that's what we're striving for this time around. We like to remind customers we have been doing this uh, for almost 50 years with all different types of glasses and all different types of safety requirements, and we have the cap cap capabilities and will continue to better that process for our customers. Um, now, Rick already mentioned this, but I will say trigger warning about Amazon. That was a uh, pretty <laughs> nightmare like for a lot of us. Um, but it did actually teach us something. And Ralph actually mentioned this as well, that we the first time around, because we work with distributors and other type of resellers, a lot of those distributors actually do not want uh, our information on the back of their glasses because they don't want their customer to find where they purchase the glasses. Um, this has now turned into a requirement and it's no longer a negotiable to actually have the manufacturer information on every pair of glasses uh, that we produce um, and including all of the safety requirements, ISO and even the outdated CE requirements because we wanna make sure that we're crossing every board. Um, this is actually something that brings me into what I encourage my fellow manufacturers, if there are any in here today. Um, Rick and I had discussed at the last meeting that we should create a more detailed structure and program behind manufacturers helping Rick create a list of everyone who they have been working with. So um, I have figured out how I'm going to organize it. I would encourage other manufacturers to go ahead and find a way for them to organize their customer list. Um, it's very, it's not traditional to do that, but because we saw the scramble in that last two weeks, having somewhere where Rick can privately go in and look and see, okay, they've worked with Wendy's, they've worked with Google, blah, 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 blah it will be helpful in the long run to keep all of the bad glasses at bay and the good glasses that from resellers, they can see who manufactured it and it'll help quite a lot. So I would encourage that. Um, lastly, I'd like to mention our motto in the office, order early and order often. Whatever you think you may need, quadruple it. And trust me when I say you will definitely get rid of your glasses and, um, if you need more, we will promise you, we will be here until the very end and we will continuously make classes and stay up to date on all of the safety standards as that's our most important part of all of this. So thank you. Thanks a lot, Sophie. Sorry for the mix up with the slides. No, it really wasn't. It was nothing crazy. I'll share the blog at the end. That was the rest of it. Okay, and we'll um, hopefully we'll be able to uh, Get it, get them posted um, onto our on our own web page. Um, okay, so um, let's go back to Ralph. I don't know if uh, there's anything left that you want to say, Ralph, but this is your opportunity to do it. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, you know, I, I think we've covered a lot of the safety aspects uh, already, but I did want to just comment um, very quickly on the one slide that Rick put up of uh, the eyeball behind the uh, unprotected telescope and the little flames. Uh, I've actually done the experiment of taking a, a pair of solar eclipse glasses and putting them at the eyepiece of an unprotected uh, telescope. And it was less than a second to vaporize a hole through the uh, filters. Uh, and, and unfortunately, I wasn't uh, accompanied by anybody who could do the photo documentation, but it's very dramatic to see that puff. There's no flame, it just vaporizes. And, uh, you know, it tells you something about what could potentially happen if an eye is there. Uh, it, it just is very destructive. So, uh, again, it's important to remember that uh, with all of these safety devices. The filter goes in the front of everything, in front of the eye, in front of the camera lens, in front of the telescope objective. You know, that's where it has to go, nowhere else uh, in order for it to be safe. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I think that's uh, something that we have to keep in mind when giving people advice, you know, uh, just even the earlier question about do you put the filters in front of your glasses or behind the glasses? And again, uh, safe thing, be, uh, you know, uh, be consistent. Everything's in front of the collecting optics for the, uh, for the eye. And um, that will ensure that things stay uh, safe and undamaged. Uh, there were a couple of questions I know that uh, we still haven't answered in the Q&A, but, uh, you know, equally with eyes is your cameras. I've, uh, you know, I've seen lots of friends melt their camera shutter curtains, uh, and um, I, I've had other people who say they may have damaged their sensors and their phones or their digital cameras. And so again, caution uh, to make sure that you've got the right filter in the right place before you try to do any imaging at all. Um, because uh, again, it'll be a very expensive thing to repair uh, if uh, you damage anything. So I think I've, I've said enough. Let's uh, get the general questions and answers and discussions. Okay, thank you. Thank you both very much. Uh, yeah, we still have quite a few really good questions in the Q&A, so I'll turn it back over to Tyler. Okay, uh, so let's see. Um, we've got a question from June McDonald. Uh, this is probably for Sophie. She says, uh, Rainbow Symphony said in response to a question I sent them not to use the eclipse glasses if more than three years old. Uh, why is that? Uh, Ralph said they were good as long as you, you handled them carefully. Um, we actually don't put a, uh, we've never put any sort of expiration date on our glasses. Other vendors, I do believe have done that. Um, if I had responded in that way, it probably wouldn't be a response I would give now as we have become, you know, more educated in, uh, in that opinion of they can, if you're keeping them safe, you can reuse them for many years. Nope. Uh, I, uh, if I may offer a, a, a supplemental to that, uh, one of the problems that we have is that the ISO standard is recognized as a European uh, normal. And European normals or European standards actually have the force of regulations in the European system. So uh, in Europe, you have to put a best before date or expiry date on product. It's part of the regulations. It's totally meaningless in the context of a lot of equipment, but it's required because the law says so. Okay. That's the end uh, of the story. So we've got a, uh, a question here from Alphonse Sterling. Uh, what do you advise people about looking at the diamond ring? That is, when do you stop, start looking at totality? Would you like me to handle that, Ralph, or at least give you my take on it? Because I, I thought yeah, you about can, this. You start. <laughs> yeah, I thought about this long and hard for 2017, and I came up with a plan uh, that uh, people who followed it 
including me, uh, felt pretty comfortable with. So what I suggested was um, keep your solar filters on at the beginning of totality to watch for Bailey's beads. And then when the last bead fades, take your filters off. Now this means you won't see the diamond ring at the beginning of totality, but it also means that your eyes won't have been dazzled by it and you'll get a really good view of the corona. Mm. At the end of totality, don't put your glasses on until the diamond ring. See the diamond ring and as soon as it becomes too bright uh, to be comfortable, you know, just put your filters back on. Um, and it, I, it worked. I liked it for myself. I felt I got a better view of the corona. And the people who follow that advice said they thought it was a pretty effective way to do it, too. What do you think, Ralph? Yeah, I, I think that's a really good strategy because the, the problem is that if you uh, uncover for the last Bailey's bead, uh, you wreck your dark adaptation. That is the dark adaptation that you've got from uh, having looked at the sun through the uh, viewer uh, that allows you to see the corona in its splendor right after uh, the uh, totality begins. Uh, what I've done sometimes is I, I wait until I see that very last bead about to disappear and then I take the, uh, the glasses away so that I actually see the diamond ring going in but it's still uh, just brief enough that yeah my dark adaptation is sort of disrupted but I can still see the corona easily but you know I, I've, I've seen about what 20 total eclipses in my lifetime so I've had plenty of practice at doing that uh, but for a neophyte I think your uh, uh, strategy will work really, really well and uh, does allow for a really good view. Uh, here's a question uh, probably for Sophie uh, from Carl Freilenhoven. Uh What about a child size eclipse glasses? I've seen the ones that fold at the temple to shorten the earpiece, but not smaller across the face. Yeah, I think that's a really great question. It's something that we're definitely considering um, with our plastic and also with paper. Um, but one of the most popular amongst educators in schools, which um, I have to ask Ralph if this is all right, but our viewing uh, card, what mm -hmm. ended up happening was for children, it ended up being that it get, made them more responsible to keep it held up to their face rather than it potentially slipping off, even if you were to make child sizes. So what we did was we started to include it with a lanyard. And so kids could wear it around their neck and pick it up and then they were responsible to keep it up. Um, that we saw a lot of great feedback from teachers in schools where they were more comfortable with the viewer card. So that's what I would recommend at the moment. Uh, but it's definitely something that we're, we're considering among with like a few other products that we might add to the line. Yeah, I would say that that's, uh, again, a really good idea because with little kids, you, you've got to be watching them all the time. With right. glasses, the problem is uh, uh, that they don't know that they can't move around with these things on their faces. And so, uh, you know, you, you really want to make sure that they know if you consciously hold this thing up, you don't move while you're looking at the sun. And, uh, you know, that keeps them safe in many ways. Uh, if they're just wearing them, they'll forget. And, uh, you know, especially really young kids. Uh, and it is a, a real problem to um, supervise them and make sure that they are safe. Uh, now I can tell you that uh, the ISO standard system, we do have child size head forms as part of our program. And uh, again, we will be allowing for uh, child size product when the 123-12-2 uh, does get revised. But again, I think that the, uh, the viewer cards are really, really effective. And uh, I would really encourage their use. They're a great tool. So here's a question that came from three different people. Uh, and this was in response to the idea of your eye being dazzled by that first diamond ring. 
Uh, what about the patch over the one eye practice where you, you look at the diamond ring with one eye, but keep the other eye covered so that as soon as totality occurs, you've then got the dark adapted eye that was patched. Does that actually work? Yes, it does. Uh, but uh, again, one of the problems is making sure you can keep that one eye closed all the time or, or blocked. Uh, a pirate patch works wonders if that's the way you want to do it. Um, and um, you just have to remember to take the patch off. Uh, you know, I, I remember one person who tried to do that and they said afterwards, yeah, it looked great, except I kept the patch on for the entire total of phase. <laughs> I, I think it's not it at all. It's I, I've seen I've seen people do it and 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 swear by it. Um, I tried it once, and I, I'm just one of these people who, if my two eyes are not seeing equally, um, it's just very disorienting to me, and I found it very uncomfortable. Um, so I, I think it's it's definitely worth trying because people do say that it works very nicely. Um, but I think, you know, some of us uh, just aren't going to like it because of, of what it does to your vision. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah. Some uh, people can manage to walk around uh, monocularly for a while, but it, it's uncomfortable uh, for a lot of people. So, uh, Let's see. Uh, Sophie, there was a question from uh, Lucia Brimer asking approximately how much does it cost to customize Eclipse glasses? Uh, for a company with their name and logo? Yeah, um, it ranges. So uh, I'd be happy to send a quote over to anybody who would just like to even get a rough estimate. But we start at about um, a thousand pieces minimum, and then we go down from uh, up from there. So price, uh, quantity goes up, pricing goes down. And uh, we could definitely send a full breakdown in here if anybody would like sort of everything in writing. Okay. Another, another way to look at it, uh, having ordered them in bulk for Sky and Telescope and for the AAS is just that, uh, you know, whereas you might pay two or three dollars for a single unit, uh, once you start ordering them in the thousands, they're, they're costing, you know, 50 cents or less per unit. So yeah, they're in the cents, definitely. Yeah. Uh, let's see, there's a question from somebody from uh, Mark Stolberg asking, how safe is it to view a partial eclipse reflected in a puddle of water? Oh. <laughs> Actually, that works quite well because, uh, you know, that, that was an old, old technique to uh, look at the reflection of, uh, of the sun in water. And, um, uh, you know, it's hard it, to look you, at it for very long, though. No, it, it's still bright. Yeah, um, the reflectivity is nothing like those low transmittances that you were showing us in the yeah, solar filter. So it's, it's, a, it's a dazzlingly bright image, but you can see the crescent but you wouldn't want to look at it very long. An occasional sort of sidelong glance, I think is okay. Uh, let's see, uh, Lucia Breimer also asks, uh, if you have a safe solar filter on a telescope, is there still a limit on the time you can point the telescope at the sun before the optics uh, could become overheated? Uh, I, I don't want to damage my telescope. I um, think the answer is there's no limit if it's, if it's a, truly safe solar filter. I mean, if it's a transmittance of, you know, one part in 10 to the five, it's basically like pointing your telescope at the full moon. Yeah, I've got a, a solar filter on my telescope in my home observatory. And, you know, I'll track the sun for hours uh, through the day without any problems. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's rejecting most of that uh, light energy. Okay. Uh, let's see how are we doing on time here, Rick. Uh, we've got time here. for a few more questions. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, Tom Gold asks, "Oh, do you make a viewing card with a safely breakaway lanyard, especially for children?" So yeah, Sophie, you mentioned that. Was that something that you do make, or we're looking into making? We do make it with a lanyard right now that has a, a metal clasp. So to simply put, it wouldn't technically be a, a quick breakaway, but I. I really love that suggestion and I definitely think it could be something we could incorporate into, uh, you know, future lanyards for children. That's a great idea, but they are very long. So they're, they're not too hard to get off. Okay. Uh, let's see. 
we've got a couple of questions again about the sunrise issue with uh, with the eclipse. Um, all right, let's see. Let me let me read this one. Alphonse Sterling asks regarding looking at the sun near sunrise sunset. Obviously, the visible light intensity is reduced. Uh, although, as you pointed out, it's not necessarily reduced enough to be safe. But is the infrared or UV intensity also reduced at those times too? Um, so, what? yeah, what can you say about that? Well, everything is going to be attenuated by the air column. Uh, there, uh, you know, basically there's no ultraviolet in the sunlight uh, when the solar disk is um, below about oh, 15 degrees or so from the horizon, uh, you just don't measure any ultraviolet in that uh, radiation at all. Uh, there is infrared, but it's also attenuated and it really doesn't play a role in, uh, in eye damage. Uh, you just aren't exposed long enough uh, with a naked eye view uh, or rather an unaided view um, uh, to sunlight uh, at that low uh, altitude. Perfectly safe as far as the uh, UV and the IR are concerned. Okay. Um, uh, Sophie, one quick question for you. Uh, earlier, somebody had asked if okay. any of the eclipse information on the back of cards would be printed in, in French. Yeah, we actually do have Spanish and English instructions currently, uh, but if there are any, especially for our, our Canadian uh, eclipse goers who need it in, Fran in French, we can definitely do that. We've done it before. Okay. Uh, and here's a question from Marie Yves Node. Um, can you talk again? Okay, this is back about the sunrise issue. Uh, will people watching the sunrise with glasses won't be able to see anything at first? What should we tell those folks? So it sounds like she's asking if you put the glasses on to watch the sunrise, you won't you won't see anything until the sun gets bright enough to get through the filters. Um, it's an interesting question. Uh, you know, I mean, we have this issue at sun. Most of us are more used to watching the sun at sunset. Um, and, you know, there comes a point in a sunset where, uh, unless the sky is totally clear at the horizon, well, I'm talking about sunset like on the ocean, um, you, don't need, you don't need any protection. You can watch the last bit of the sun disappear. Um, but if you, don't, if you don't know where that's going to happen at the sunrise necessarily, so you've got these glasses on, um, I mean, most of us aren't going to have a, a zero degree horizon. You know, like we'll have some mountains or some buildings or some undulations or something. So by the time the sun does rise, it's already going to be a few degrees up, most likely. Um, I, I think you, uh, yeah, I don't know, Ralph, this is a tough one. I, I, I kind of feel like you, you just kind of uh, don't look directly at it and just try to gauge how bright it is as it's rising. Um, and if it's, uh, if it's not too terribly bright, just see if you can steal a quick glance without, without protection and if it's okay. And if it is, you're fine. And if it isn't, uh, you put the glasses on and wait till you can start to see a little, a little something in, in the glasses and then you'll, you know, you'll watch the rest of the eclipse. I think that you can sort of gauge it in terms of driving into a sunrise or a sunset. You know, there, there's a certain point at which the sun is so bright, it's really uncomfortable to look at it, uh, even though it's down near the horizon. And, you know, we're talking about a yellow uh, to yellow white sun uh, at that point. Uh, if it's that uncomfortable, then, uh, you know, a momentary glance just to gauge what the color of the sun is, is enough to say, okay, it's yellow white means I definitely need to use the filter or try to use the filter. If it's a red sun, um, it's not uh, going to be bright enough to make you uncomfortable, then it's safe to look at. But, you know, the, the problem is that as the sun climbs higher, uh, then, uh, you know, at some point you've got to just remember if it starts getting uncomfortable, start using the filter. But I, I think Rick is right that a lot of people are not going to be in a position where they have an unobstructed view of the horizon. 
by the time they see the sun, uh, it's going to be eight to 10 degrees above the horizon or higher. And at that point, it's bright enough that uh, you'll have to use the filter uh, no matter what. Okay, Tyler, I think we're going to wrap it here. Um, I, do, I know there are lots more questions, which is, uh, which is uh, both good in that there's so much interest and not so good in that we're running out of time. Uh, but as I mentioned uh, in the first session, uh, we're going to be saving all of these questions and everything that's come up in the chat. Uh, and we're going to uh, address it uh, in an FAQ on our website, uh, or perhaps with a follow-up email when we announce the availability of the um, of the uh, video recordings and things like that. So, uh, so we're not ignoring your questions; they're not going to get lost, um, and we'll do our best to get them answered. Um, I want to thank both uh, Ralph and Sophie very much for your participation in this session. Uh, really appreciate your willingness to join us and spend so much time with us. Uh, we'll get your uh, slides posted, um, Sophie, so that people can have a look at them. Um, no let me uh, ask Claire and Angela if either of them has anything that they would like to say to close out the afternoon or evening or morning or whatever it is where you are. Uh, I did want to mention that, that I threw the uh, uh, link to the virtual networking lounge back in the chat. Um, it's going to be open uh, for, for an hour now. And then it's going to also open in the morning for an hour before the program begins. So uh, I saw tons of people in there during the break, and it wasn't a very long break. Uh, so you'll have a full hour now and another full hour uh, tomorrow before we get started on session three. Okay. So I would declare. Oh, go ahead, Angela. I was just going to say, I actually have to run away and pick up a kid from school because it's that time of day where I am. Um, so I will not be on the virtual networking this afternoon, but I will be there tomorrow morning. So. Um, you can come and if you really, really want to talk to me, you can find me there tomorrow. Have a fun evening. Good stuff. And we should say that the link to the networking lounge Zoom room uh, is on the Eclipse web page, uh, the workshop web page. So you can click that link. You will need to remember what the password is. So if you haven't already, you might jot down the password, which is uh, it's a I'll put it back in the, the chat window. It's too to read out um, with capitals and whatnot, but there's the password. So uh, if you lose the link, you can just click on it in from the workshop uh, webpage on the AAS Eclipse website. Um, I don't have anything else to contribute other than to say thank you everybody for joining us today. And we look forward to speaking to you tomorrow. The virtual lounge will open at nine Pacific noon Eastern, and then we'll have our first, uh, our first session beginning at 10 Pacific, uh, 1 p.m. Eastern, which will focus on local and community planning efforts. And then in the afternoon, <laughs> afternoon, wherever you are, the next session will be uh, on the state and national planning efforts. And that will begin at 12.15 Pacific or 3.15 Eastern. So we hope we will see you again tomorrow. Thank you, everybody.